Welcome back to Approved Unto God. I'm your host, Joshua Govitz. We left off last time in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19, and today we're going to be going through Genesis 3, verses 20 through 21. Uh, let's pray before we get started. Father, Lord, thank you for this time to be able to preach and teach your word, and I just pray, Lord, that you would just give the hearers understanding and help me, Lord, to understand uh, perfectly well what I'm teaching and that I would teach it straight and right. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 20 through 21. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Verse 20 shows us that, uh, that first birth that brings us into this world. This is the natural this is what brings about the natural birth, the natural man. In verse 21, we're going to show how there's a need for another birth, for a rebirth, a spiritual birth. This comes only from God. This does not come from, from, from woman. You see in verse 20, And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. But those that are going to live eternally, cannot get that eternal life from Eve. You are, you, are born, you are born condemned. You're born with a sin nature. You know, I hear people say, you know, about the mark of the beast. If I get, if the mark of the beast comes out with Bill Gates and all this, you know, he's supposed to be trying to give us a microchip and all this. They said that I, I won't take it. Well, the thing is, if you won't receive Jesus Christ right now, you're condemned already is what the Bible teaches. If all you have been is born physically into this world through Eve, you are not alive unto God. You are still spiritually dead. You need a rebirth. Jesus said, know ye not that you must be born again. So we're going to look in John chapter 3, and we're going to look at verse 5, uh, 5a. When you say 5A, that's talking about just the first portion or the first half of that verse. That's why I say A. A for you Canadian viewers. I know I'm corny. John chapter 3 and verse 5A. And a certain man was there which had... Nope, that's chapter 5. Sorry. Like that didn't look right. John chapter 3, verse 5a. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, he's talking to Nicodemus, he was a Pharisee who was inquiring of God about, about eternal life. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of, of God. But that first part is what I want to look at. Before he talks about being born of the Spirit, he says, Except a man be born of water. Um, now your Campbellite preacher, which is uh, Church of Church of Christ, there's Church of God, and that's more apostolic. Um, they run along the lines of Pentecostals. I believe that is a form of Pentecostalism. But Church of Christ is uh, another religion, uh, Christian religion, that teaches that everything. Whenever they see water, they believe that water saves you. They believe that it has to come out of their spigot. But water is what brings a man into the kingdom of God. That's what they believe. You, you have to be baptized in their church, and that brings about eternal life. But we, I got a problem with that because John the Baptist came, he was given a baptism of repentance, and Jesus Christ needed no repentance. He was not a sinner. He, and if water saved, why was Jesus Christ being baptized? No, that's not what water does not teach, or the Bible does not teach that water does wash away sins. It's the blood of Christ that washes away your sins. What can wash away my sins, as the old song says? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Water is not going to do it. That just does not make any sense. And then I've also heard people interpret this, except the man be born of water and of the Spirit. They would say water. Well, you know, we're washed with the water of the Word of God. That's not it either, because... There's really only one interpretation to this, and that's the correct interpretation, and that's found in its context. So what are they talking about except the man be born of water? Look on at verse 6, and we'll get the context. 
that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So you see, the context is saying that that which is born of the flesh. What do we say in Genesis chapter 3 and, verses 19, and verse, uh, verse 20? That Eve, for she is the mother of all the living. That's what Adam called her. So that is the physical. That is the physical birth. So that which is born of the flesh. That is, that's what that's talking about. You're born physically. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Because what did he say? He says that you need to be born of water and of the spirit. Nicodemus, you want eternal life? You have to be born twice. You have to be born again. And then Nicodemus gets confused and he starts saying, what, I have to enter in back into my mother's womb? Well, he got the first birth right. A lot of these other ones, they don't. The, these Campbellites and all that, and, and people that say that that interpretation is that you need to be born or washed of the word or you need to be uh, baptized to be saved. Nicodemus had that first part right. He was saying, about he knew it had to do with a physical birth but what he didn't understand is that the next birth is spiritual you can't go back into your mother's womb but that's why it says born of water because when you're born of water you're born your your mother's uh water breaks and you're born you come out of water but the next birth needs to be spiritual so let's see what i have in my notes being born of water or physical birth when a woman is about to give birth, her water breaks. Interpretation found in the beginning uh, of verse 6. So we went through that as a physical birth. And the scripture says that that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Um, and my next point, this first birth imputes no other spiritual understanding, but of a knowledge of a creator. This is all in Romans 1. And our conscience is given to shed light on the basics of right and wrong. So we all know that. Nobody really has to tell you what right and wrong is. You know that instinctually from, from your birth. God gives you that light. He gives you that conscience. And uh, he also gives us an accountability to God. We know that we are accountable to God. And later on, through education, many people that, that don't want light, that don't want God, will eventually try to lose that accountability and say that, you know what, I came from a big bang. I came from stardust. And why? Why do they want to believe that? Why do they want to believe man over God? Well, because they love their sin. They love darkness. And they don't want to be accountable to God. And Romans 1 deals with that. Let's turn there real quick. Romans 1, verses 19 through 20. Romans 1, verses 19 through 20. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. That's talking about everybody that comes into this world. For God has showed it unto them. He showed, he showed, uh, he, he's given them knowledge and, and he's manifested himself through creation. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world. And by the way, everything that's, uh, that you see with your eyes is composed of things that you cannot see atoms are so small you can't see them with the naked eye so what everything that is made is made of something invisible for the invisible things see that you know science is still trying to catch up to the bible for the invisible things from the creation of the world are clearly seen god expects you to clearly see that which is invisible being understood and he expects you to understand he says you do understand being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. People say, well, I, I, God needs to prove himself to me. I need to see it. I need to see him. I need to see a miracle. You already know in your heart that he exists. It's, it's proven in this creation. There, you, you wouldn't look at a tower. You wouldn't look at a building and say, hmm, I believe that over thousands and millions of years that this building created itself. No, you know that you know what, this building is here and somebody had to have built it. Why do you believe it? Oh, this book right here. Genesis chapter 3 by James Knox. This book wrote itself over thousands of years. Nobody's that stupid. Everybody knows that even if something as simplistic as a book, all it is is black ink on white pages. You know that somebody created that book. Somebody had to put the effort to make that. But why is it that when you see this complex world and, and the trees and the, and the uh, butterflies and all these different animals, oh man, it, it, 
and the way the, the solar system works, the way the moon uh, goes around the, the earth and, and the tides and all this different stuff, and you think, oh, it's just by accident. You, you don't think that. You're, you've been taught that, and you've accepted that as truth over the word of God because you love darkness rather than light. That's what the problem is. You're attracted to darkness. You don't want light. God gave you enough light to be saved from your birth. He's given. He, the Bible says that he lighteth every man that cometh into the world. That's John chapter 1. You're without excuse. You're not gonna. You're not gonna stand before God at the great white throne and say you didn't. You didn't give me enough knowledge. You didn't give me enough revelation. You had it. You didn't want it. Let's look at Romans chapter one and verse seventeen through eighteen. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. And by the way, He's the only righteous one. From faith to faith. So God reveals his righteousness from faith to faith, that which is right. You respond in faith to something God shows you that's right, and you say, you know what, I agree with that. I believe that is right. And God says, you know what, I'm going to give him more righteous revelation. I'm going to reveal more truth from my word and see how he handles that. If you respond and say, yeah, I, I believe God's right. I believe that's right, something that I learned from the word of God. I read about Jonah, and I believe that he did get swallowed by that whale, and I, I, I believe that. God says, you know what? What about Jesus Christ being in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights? Because he said the illustration that Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection was Jonah was in the heart of the whale for three days and three nights. And you know what? Jonah died in that whale, and he was brought back to life, and then the, the whale spit him up or spat him up on the earth, and then he preached. But anyways... That was a death and a resurrection and a burial. He, he went way down in the heart of the earth. The Bible says that he actually went to hell. Well, Jesus Christ died on the cross. And for three days and three nights, he was in the heart of the earth. And he said that's an illustration, just like Jonah, and that he rose again from the dead. So if you believe that truth, and if some people would say, well, that's a silly story about that Jonah and the whale. Well, if you won't believe that, you're not going to believe the latter part about Jesus Christ being resurrected from the dead. You see what I'm saying? From faith to faith. You need to believe uh, simple truth before you believe a more maybe complex truth. That's the way it works. It's a law. Okay, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. You're not going to get saved by faith and all of a sudden now God talks to you. Now all of a sudden now God reveals himself to you all the time in dreams or something. I'm not, I'm not saying that God can't break some sort of uh, bounds that maybe we might put him in a box. God can do whatever he wants. But we're going to live by faith. We're saved by faith and then we end up living by faith. Every single day we're going to have to learn to trust him and trust in his word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Oh, I forgot to check and see how long my video is. Uh, I, I can only go 29 minutes is what this camera allows, and then I'm going to have to press uh, stop on the recording and re redo it. And hopefully I don't go too long here and get anything cut off. I think I've been going for probably about 15 minutes already. Romans 1, 17 through 18 shows mankind that the righteousness of God comes through faith. And that the wrath of God comes from acting in disobedience to the truth that you already hold. In other words, you hold the truth but don't believe it to be true, which is the opposite of faith, which is unbelief. Uh, we, we might better re read verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So you see the wrath of God revealed from heaven and you see it upon the ungodliness and the unrighteousness. You see people fall under God's wrath and you, and it teaches you that you know what this is the wrath that comes upon upon people who have truth but reject it um, I'm, I want to read that again shows man verse 17 through 18 shows mankind that the righteousness of God comes through faith and that the wrath of God comes from acting in disobedience to the truth that you already hold in other words, you hold the truth, but don't believe it to be true. That is holding the, uh, that's the opposite of faith, that's unbelief, but you're holding the truth and unrighteousness, is what the Bible says. 
why does a natural man hold the truth of God revealed as an unrighteous thing? Why does he think God is unrighteous? But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The natural man cannot receive truth uh, when, when he's clinging to, to uh, unbelief and he's clinging to darkness. You have to be a spiritual man to receive spiritual truth. Or, if you're unsaved, you have to want light. You have to want righteousness. When you see righteousness and you see God's truth, you have to believe it and, and want to receive it. And God said, I will give you that light. I will allow you to understand. I will open your eyes of your understanding. And that will lead to salvation. But you reject truth, you're going to get more darkness. You're not getting no more light. Um, what I just quoted there about the natural man receiving not the spiritual things, that's 1 Corinthians 2.14. And let's get another scripture in. If I have told you earthy, uh, earthly things, this is Jesus talking, if I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? He, he used a lot of different illustrations that were earthly illustrations. He gave a lot of parables. And he says, if you can't understand that, how are you going to understand the spiritual side of it? He's like, I'm trying to illustrate things to you on, on a level where you can understand. Talking about the sower, sow, and seed. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people's work back then was farming. And, and even today, a lot of people are farmers. They can understand that. They can understand how seed grows, where to plant a seed, and, and why a seed might not grow on a stony area. Um, so he, that's how he illustrates these truths to man. Excuse me. John chapter 3 and verse 18 through 21. Let's turn there. It goes that indigestion all, all the time. It likes to creep up when I'm preaching. Keep, keeps me in check. Lest I be exalted above measure. John chapter 3 verses 18 through 21. He that believeth on him is not condemned. So if you believe on Jesus Christ... You don't have to worry about hellfire, condemnation. You're not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. What's his name? Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. What's another name given to him? Emmanuel, which is being interpreted, God with us. Now, if you believe in his name, he is Emmanuel. He is God with us. God cannot lie. God cannot sin. God lives the perfect life. That's Jesus Christ. He's God manifest in the flesh. And what? Why was he here? He died so he could save his people from their sins. If you believe on that name, you are not condemned. But if you don't believe on his name, you are condemned already. You say, well, I, I, you know, I know they might be giving out um, microchips saying that we need to control this pandemic and, and you need to play along with that. And it's going to be the mark of the beast. And you say, well, I'm not, I'm not going to take that no matter what. I won't take that. But you're already condemned. It's not like, oh, once you get the mark of the beast, you're condemned. Yeah, the, the, the mark of the beast seals your fate. There, that there's nothing that can reverse it. But if you are the natural man, if you have been, if you've been born in this world and you have never received Christ by faith into your heart, you are still, you are condemned right now already. The judgment, if you die, you're, go you're already condemned. You're already going to hell. You need to take care of that. You need to take care of that thing. You need to take this life serious. It's not all fun and games. When God reveals something, I, he's revealing truth to you right now. Don't, don't push it away and don't say, well, you know, well, I was taught this. My religion says this. Fooey on your religion. Junk it. God said that, Jesus Christ said that you, that he was talking about the Pharisees, he says, through your tradition, you make the word of God of none effect. Through a lot of people's tradition and their religious creeds, they make the word of God of none effect in their life. The word of God is so powerful, he spoke the worlds into, into, into existence, the universe into existence. That word is so powerful, the word is held above the name of Jesus. He says that he holds his word above his name. But yet that powerful word cannot work in your life effectually because you cling to traditions. Junk your traditions. There's stuff that I grew up as a Baptist and I've always believed 
And it was hard for me to depart from those things because that's what I was taught growing up. But as I grow in faith and, I, and, and trust in the word of God, I don't care what Baptist tradition says. I care what the word of God says. I'm a Bible believer above being a Baptist, though I am a Baptist. But it's most important that you believe God and you believe his word. And when it hair lips your tradition, forget your tradition. Go with God. Go with his word. What's clearly taught. John chapter 3, verses 18 through 21 explains why the natural man re rejects truth from God. And I don't even know if I read all that. Let me, let me go through it again. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's as far as we got. We're going down to 21. And this is the condemnation. This is what condemns a man. You know what? I'm going to stop right there because I think I might be pretty close to a half hour and I don't want to get this cut off. And uh, we'll restart the, the last half here in a second. Okay, we're picking back up over here in verse 19. And this is the condemnation. This is what condemns mankind. Man and woman. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter race or creed. This is a condemnation. That light has come into the world. What is that light? Light represents truth. Also, light represents Jesus Christ. It says that he is the light of the world. While he is in the world, he is the light of the world. And now, what is the light of the world? He says that we are, the church is the light of the world while he's gone. He says that you don't light a candlestick and put it under a bushel. You put it up on, the, on a hill so that the world can see it. You know what? And, and we're speakers of truth, the church is. We're speaking the truth of the word of God and, and doing what the Lord Jesus called us to do after he saved us because we are not our own. We are bought the price. So there is light. There's light all over this nation. There's light and there's truth about Jesus Christ. Uh, so light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. That's why people reject the light. They reject the truth because they love their darkness more. That's why this, when a street preacher is out there preaching the truth, people can't help but just walk by and try to... Uh, you know, diffuse what you're doing and try to say, well, what are you doing out here? You know, they, they don't say, what what is so-and-so doing out there spinning one of those little things about like a phone, you know, get this phone plan or whatever. They don't, they don't question them. They don't question uh, anybody else but the Christian. Why are you out here, they say. You know, and they try to cause you trouble. Why? Because they want to stop light from being sh shown out to the world. They're against Christ. That's what it is. For everyone that doeth evil, in verse 20, for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. That's why they they have to, like, you know, try to diffuse what you're doing. They, they hate Jesus Christ to the point that they try to put a monkey wrench in you serving him and trying to get the truth out. Burpee. <laughs> for, and, and it's all going to be in there. You know why? Because... I'm not, I'm not going to sit there and edit a bunch of stuff. I'm, I'm just lazy, I guess. So it'll be on there. <laughs> For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. So they hate the light, and they're not going to come towards the light. They might go to the light just to say, yeah, I don't want that. But they're not going to go to the light and say, oh, can I, can I uh, inquire more? Uh, now, there are some exceptions to the rules, and that's the people that are searching. Because some people are searching for truth. Some people go to church and they might not even be in the right religion, but they're there because they're, they know that there is a God and they're looking for truth. And I don't believe that a person will remain in a false religion for very long if their heart is seeking truth. God will show them the error of their way or of what, they're seek, of what religion they might be in. And eventually they will find the truth, you know, because they are searching. Verse 21, but he that doeth truth, now that's what, I, that's what I'm talking about, the person that when they, they want to do right, they want to they wanna obey. He that doeth truth cometh to the light. You know, and people might say, well, that sounds like work salvation. I'm not interpreting nothing. I'm just really reading what the Bible says. This is talking about a, a, a lost person that ends up coming to know, to know salvation. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, 
that they are wrought in God. And, and eventually they, they will find Jesus Christ from faith to faith. This is, I believe, what the Bible is teaching here. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 5, verses 18 through 23. Who would have thought so much right there in Genesis chapter 3? But it's really the seed plot of the whole Bible. Genesis 5, verses 18 through 23. And, and God's showed me so much, and I've learned so much so far. I'm, I, I hope you're enjoying it. I'm really enjoying this. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity. So there's iniquity, and they're drawing it in. With what? Cords of vanity. What's vanity? Just everything. Look around you. You know, Netflix and... Uh, golf and whatever and i'm not saying everything's evil but i'm just talking about people will draw things in with cords of vanity they they love vain things you ever hear the average conversation that takes place at work what is it about it's about football vanity it's about uh sorry my mind doesn't work as sharp as it used to but pretty much anything but but spiritual truth anything that's of value. It's just a bunch of vain thoughts. People live for vain things. And it makes me think of Jonah, and it says that you forsake your own mercy because of vanity. You, for vanity. Hmm. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and sin as it were with a cart rope. They say, let him make speed and hasten his work. They're talking about God. We want to see him work now. I, I prayed something, Lord, and I prayed that I'd win the lottery, and I, I want an answer now. They want God to jump through their hoops, that we may see it. You know what? Oh, God, show me a sign. I want to see that you're real. And, uh, oh, God, if you get me out of this, I promise I'll do this. It, all they want is a God of immediate response to them. They want God to serve them. That's not the humble heart. That's not the heart that God is going to reveal himself to. He's going to reveal it to the humble heart. And let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come that we may know it. They're like, oh, God, show us. Oh, we want to see your counsel. They don't. They, they just want to see a miracle. They don't want to live by faith. They just want what they can see. Woe unto them. That's a curse. Woe unto them that call evil good. That's America. And good evil. You know, they, they say that the Christian's wrong, but they say that the the woman that wants to kill her baby's right. They call evil good and good evil. That put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. They have everything backwards. They think uh, the righteous life of a Christian is, is evil. They think that Roe versus Wade, and they think that uh, transgenderism and all this stuff um, and separation of church and state where it, in its context like get God and get the Bible, get the prayer out of school, all that kind of stuff, they think that's good. But they think that Christians bringing their Bibles to school is wrong and evil. They think a university that's run teaching evolution is right, but they teach they don't teach the Bible. Because why? They think that's unrighteous. They think that's evil. That's America. You wonder why this virus has hit us. You wonder why all our idols are being knocked down. Um, Hulk Hogan kind of put it really well. I, I suggest you actually look up what he put on Twitter. I don't have a Twitter, but he said something about um, God raining down all this judgment and the plagues over in Egypt, and it knocked down all the idols that Egypt had. And... God actually allowing this virus to, to destroy man's idols. Talking about we worship sports heroes, so they shut down all the uh, arenas. And we worship musicians, so they shut down the civic centers. And that we worship uh, this and that. But you'd have to look it up. R really good. And it's funny that it comes from Hulk Hogan. You wouldn't expect that. You know, maybe he wasn't real open about his faith, but maybe he's been a Christian, but maybe somewhat of a, a closet Christian. You know, we have those out there. You know, I, I think there's even people, you know, in Hollywood that might be saved, um, but they're they're living that closet Christian life, you know. And they need to identify with God and quit identifying with the heathen. Okay.
I get so sidetracked here. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes, and I see those all the time, that's people, you know, your average college student, and prudent in their own sight. To them, they're, they're the wisest thing, you know, since they're the greatest thing since sliced bread, you know. Why? Because, oh, I got a degree. You know, they won't listen to me because I believe in an old, outdated, hillbilly book, you know, called the Bible. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the, right, of the righteous from him. You know what they do? Jesus Christ is righteous, and they try to take that from him. You know what the Pharisees did? They said, he's a gluttonous man. They said, he's a wine-bibber. They said, oh, you know, he eats with sinners and publicans and all this. He, they, they want to take his righteousness from him. They try to get him to stumble. They try to get Jesus Christ to stumble at the law. Why? Because he's righteous, but they don't want him to be. You know what? The same thing happens. The servant is not above his master. When you're at work, they want you to laugh at the dirty joke. They want you to cuss and get mad and lose your temper. Why? Because they want you to be counted unrighteous. They want someone who's, who's trying to be righteous and, and wants to live right. They want you to do wrong. Why? Because it clears, it, 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 excuse me, it sears their conscience over. It makes them think, you know what? They're no better than me. That Jesus and that salvation they talk about and they always go to church and all that stuff. I don't need that. And whenever you sin and you do wrong and you lose your temper, it gives them, in their own mind, uh, you know what? I, I I don't need to listen to this guy. I don't need to. I don't need to believe on his Jesus. That's what they're doing. Okay, now I'm going to read uh, my my notes on that Isaiah five uh, five eighteen through twenty three, and it, I put explain that the uh, the man of unbelief will draw closer to iniqui iniquity while condemning God for not revealing himself in some sort of miraculous way. They take away the righteousness of the righteous from him, uh, or in other New Testament terms, they hold the truth in unrighteousness. They say, we are right, we are, we are righteous, and God, you are wrong, you are unrighteous. Or the lost man, the natural man says, we're right, we're educated. Christian, you're wrong, you're backwoods. They're wise in their own eyes. But, but they're fools. God says that he'll make the, the wisdom of this world foolishness. And it is. Compared to him, God's all-knowing. He, he knows the end from the beginning. He knows how this coronavirus is going to play out. He knows because he's outside of time. You need to start trusting God. You need to quit trusting man unless the man is quoting the Bible and he's not perverting it and he's, and he's giving you the context of what the Bible teaches. Okay, we're going to move on. Proverbs 16, verse 2. Proverbs, that's in the middle of the Bible, right after Psalms. Proverbs 16, and verse 2. All the ways of man are clean in his own eyes, and don't, doesn't everybody give their self the benefit of the doubt? Why? Because, well, I'm me. <laughs> How could I be wrong? I'm me. All the ways of man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. You know what? But God tries, tries every man's heart. He sits there and he checks everybody's heart. And you know when you read the Bible with a bad heart, he's reading you. He's, he's looking. It says that the word of God is quick and powerful. In Hebrews 4.12, for the, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing, to, uh, even uh, piercing, to the heart, oh, excuse me, I, I never misquote that, but for some reason I'm misquoting it now. Uh, but it says that he, it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That means it's discerning you, it means it's reading you. When you read the Bible, it's reading you. Remember that, so you better not have a haughty spirit. You better not have a prideful heart. You better not go into the Bible trying to correct the Bible. You better not go into the Bible... Uh, with all your wisdom and man's wisdom and trying to say, you know what, well, in the Hebrew, in the originals, it says this. No. God does not have difficulty with the English language. This book right here is perfect. And we don't need you correcting it because when you correct it, you become the authority. Or Strong's becomes the authority. No, God's word is the authority. 
Proverbs 16, 2. All the ways of man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the Spirit. So we looked at that. And now we're going to look at John chapter 3, verses 30 through 33. John 3, 30 through 33. And there's so much truth in John 3. Possibly that might be the next, uh, that next chapter that I teach. You know, I'm doing Genesis 3, and it hmm, just makes sense that maybe I could teach out of John chapter 3. We'll see. I'll pray about that. John 3, verses 30 through 33. He must increase, but I must de decrease. That's what John the Baptist said. Is it any wonder that Jesus Christ said that there is no better man born of a woman than John the Baptist? Other than himself, obviously, because he is the son of God. He's perfectly righteous. But that's what John the Baptist said. You know what? He didn't have the haughty spirit. He wasn't like the Pharisees. He was humble. And that's why he was a great man in, in, in the sight of Jesus Christ. God loves humility. He, he resists the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. You know, that's what I was talking about, the vain conversation. The average conversation is always about sports. It's always about stuff that doesn't matter in eternity. Oh, who won the so Super Bowl this year? I don't know and I don't care. You know why? Five years from now, what does it even matter? Nobody's going to remember who won the Super Bowl. It's vain. It's nothing but a distraction. You're placed here by God. This is a test and you're... You're, you're playing games. You, you think this life don't matter. You're, you're, your whole life consists of nothing but vanity. We're going to play Angry Birds to pass time. Time's precious. Jesus, you think he wasted time? No. We're here for a purpose, and we waste so much time on vain things, it's ridiculous. We'll just sit, let's sit there and watch TikTok. I didn't even know what TikTok or TikTok or whatever uh, was, and I, I asked my friend that I work with, my coworker. And he says, well, I said, what is that? Is that like, uh, I said, I don't really know all this stuff. I said, is that like, um, I'm, trying, I'm trying to think, is that like Instagram or something? He's like, oh, no, it's more like like Vine. I said, what's the Vine? He just kind of laughed, you know, I, I don't know what all that stuff is. I said, do you mean like, uh, what's what's that one where they where they had like the tongues come out and all that? I, I can't remember the name of that one. It's all ridiculous. But people sit there and distract themselves. Their whole life is nothing about cartoons, movies, amusement. Let's watch so-and-so wipe out. Let's watch so-and-so uh, do something, you know, crude or whatever. But God, reveal yourself. I don't know. I don't believe in God because he never showed me that he exists. You see how ridiculous that is? Why would God show himself to somebody who lives a life of vanity, who doesn't, who rejects every truth. When the preacher starts preaching, when somebody at, at work starts trying to tell you the truth, you block them out, you put your ear, earbuds in. You change the conversation. What, why, why would God reveal himself to you? You don't want truth. You don't want light. You just want vanity. You want goofball stuff. But if that's all you want, you want vanity, you get darkness. You don't get light. He that cometh from above is above all, and he that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. That's all they talk about. Bunch of vain junk. Even politics, too. Nothing but a bunch of vanity. He that cometh from heaven is above all. God's above all, and he's smarter than you. And what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. They won't believe God. Well, that book, the Bible, they won't believe the Bible because it's written by man. But the book that you read that tries to disprove the Bible is written by man. You see the bias? He that receiveth his testimony. This is the other end of the spectrum. This is going into the spiritual man. There's the carnal man. There's the earthly man. There's the natural man. That's the man that's born of a woman, born of Eve, born in this world. Their life consists of vanity, but what about that spiritual man? What about that man that believes God? What about the man that goes from faith to faith? What about the man who's humble? What about the man who, who receives grace from God because he is humble, because he wants light, and he obeys the light when he sees it, that, that his deeds might be made manifest, that they are wrought in God? What about, that, what about that guy? 
he that receiveth his testimony has set to his seal that God is true. He believes God. He believes God is true. And you know what? Those that believe God is true, they just get more light. And after you're saved, you know what? The more, the more you believe God's true and the more you're humble, God can keep revealing more and more to you. It's never ending. God's truth is so vast, you can study the Bible your whole life and you'll never know all the truth. But we got to move on. i got to get through this. He that is of the earth speaketh of the earth. And I, I, I put here the natural man. No man receives God's witness because they are full of pride. Remember, he must increase, but I must decrease. And what we showed in Isaiah earlier shows their arrogance would be their curse because they are wise in their own eyes. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 5, verse 21. I'm going to look at that again real quick. Show you what I'm talking about. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Until you, until you start thinking less of yourself and more of God, you're not going to receive the truth. You you gotta you gotta be humble. It's so important. God God's going to resist you. God doesn't reveal Himself to pride prideful people. You know, and that speaks for the same person too. You know, even the preachers and all that. You you you, you get too arrogant. You get too big for your britches, and you wonder why you teach the same things, the same truths that you lo that that you learned in Bible college. Because maybe you were small in your own sight back then, but after you graduated Bible college, and you became a pastor and evangelist. Uh, now you got really too big for your britches, and that's why you only preach five different sermons. And, and that's why if you try to transition into being a pastor, you, you just preach on tithing every every week or just salvation messages, and you don't get and dig into that Bible. You won't you won't preach the whole counsel of God. You know why? God hasn't revealed nothing to you in years. You know why? Because now you're too big for your britches. God loves hum, humility. He loves the humble heart. John chapter three and verse thirty three. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. Okay. Now we are going to look, start looking at those who believe God and receive his testimonies as true. Romans 1, 17 uh, says from faith to faith. That's what the Bible teaches. Romans 2, 7, we're going to look in there. Now, I love Romans. There's so much doctrine in there to be learned. That would take eternity just to learn Romans. Romans 2, 7. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. You know what? That's not talking about somebody who's saved. That's talking about a person that is seeking eternal life. That's a person that might even be religious. The person that might go to a Catholic church um, because that's what they've been taught at, at a young age, that, that they're Catholic. And eventually they start seeking uh, the Bible. They say, man, how come we're not turning to the Bible in here. Um, you know what? Um, I, I got a Bible at home and I started reading and it talked about immersion. It talked about John the Baptist dunking Jesus under the water. Why are we sprinkling babies? Why are we sprinkling our heads and calling that baptism? And they start questioning, you know why? Because they want truth. And eventually they get out of that. And then God leads them to, to a, church, a church that believes the right way and teaches the right way. So, why? Why are they seeking truth? Because deep down, people want to live forever. Nobody wants to die ever. They don't want to die a physical death. And they sure don't want to die a spiritual death for eternity in the lake of fire. And people that have an a, a understanding that God is right, and he would be right to judge me, he would be right to condemn me forever in a lake of fire, you know what they do? They start seeking truth. They, they start looking for uh, immortality. They start looking for eternal life. And they might look in a religion and think, you know what, maybe the water baptism can save me. Maybe I can get eternal life that way. But if they're sincere in their heart, God is going to show them that, nope, the water don't save you. Nope, your religion doesn't save you. Nope, your rosary beads can't save you. Nope, the priest can't save you. You need Jesus Christ. You need his sacrifice. His sacrifice is the only uh, sacrifice that I will receive. Uh, Cain was religious, but Abel brought the right sacrifice. You know why? Because he believed God. Cain didn't. Cain just wanted religion. And, and there's people that will stay stuck in their religion because they're like the Pharisees who believe the tradition of men above the word of God, and they might just stay lost in, 
in a religion for the rest of their life. And, and there's a bunch of people that will die in their religion lost without God. Your religion can't save you. I don't care if you're a Buddhist. I don't care if you're a Baptist. Uh, religion doesn't save. Jesus Christ saves. Only God can save. Okay. That's Romans 2, 7. Those who want truth and are truly searching for eternal life, they will eventually have revealed to them that Jesus is that eternal life that they seek. We got probably about five minutes. John 3, uh, 21. Those who do not tr or who do truth and obey their conscience will come to the light. John three twenty one. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be may manifest that they are wrought in God. And I know we already looked at that, but uh, we're talking about not the natural man. We're talking about. Well, yes, the natural man that's coming to God. He was on his way to believing the ultimate truth that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died in your place for your sins, and that he died and he was buried and he rose again from the dead, and that he can save you if you trust him. That's these people that are coming to the truth. Isaiah 42, 5 through 7. I'm going to stop it right here, and then we're going to continue. Okay, we're back. Isaiah chapter 42 verses 5 through 7. 42, 5 through 7. Thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that, that walk therein. I the Lord have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. So God is going to give light to the Gentiles. He gave light to the Jews, but he also will give light to the Gentiles. He is a light to the whole world. That's why he came, to be a light. Isaiah 49, 6. And he said, "It is a lit, or excuse me. It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to restore the preserved of Israel. I also will give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth." So he is the salvation to the end of the earth. It doesn't matter what remote corner of the earth you live in; he is what you need. He need. I mean, excuse me. You need Jesus Christ, and if you do truth, if you obey the light that God gives you, whatever little bit he reveals. If he just reveals the beginning of, uh, of understanding is that he created everything and you see those stars in the, in the sky at nighttime and you say, wow, there's a greater power out there. There's a God out there. There has to be. And I'm really small and he's really big. And you know what? God says, see, he believes me. I'm going to give him more truth. And you know what? If you have that kind of heart, God says, I'm going to give you the missionary. I'm going to send a missionary to you and you're going to be able to receive the truth of the gospel. But some people say, well, what about the heathen that never heard? Some heathen may never hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection, but God is going to condemn them to hell anyways. You know why? Because they rejected some other truth, some little truth about creation or whatever, and they said, "That's no, nope, I don't even want that. Then God says, why should I send a missionary then? You, if you won't believe, like what I was saying, if you won't believe Jonah and the whale, the story of Jonah and the whale, how are you going to believe the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ? You're not going to. Okay, now John chapter 1, verses 4 through 9. A lot of turning, a lot of turning, but it's good. We're doing a Bible study. This is a Bible study. Why? We want to be approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. This is rightly dividing the word of truth. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. It's talking about Jesus. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. That's because you're still a natural man. Remember, you're natural. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, 
that all men through him might believe. So he was the forerunner. He was pointing the way to, to Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is coming on the scene and we got a bunch of people right now that are in those days, in John's days, that believed that they were saved by keeping the law or, or their sacrifices or whatever. And he had to point the way that, no, Jesus Christ is what's, who saves, not your religion. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. And you know who came to John? Those who wanted truth. Those who were seeking truth. And, and John was tough because when the Pharisees actually came to him and started trying to mess him up, trying to mess with him, he says, you're, you're a generation of vipers. He says, who, is, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And it's funny because Jesus said the same thing. Okay, and that's in verse 9. That was the true light. And the King James translators put the true light, and they put light in capital, a capital L. You know why? Because that's talking about a person. I, I love that. I love the way it's capitalized. That was the true light. I don't need to go to the Greek. I don't even know what the Greek says. But I'll take the, the English. So no thank you on the Greek. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He gives light to every man. There's no man that he leaves in darkness and doesn't give a chance, that doesn't give the measure of faith to be saved. Everybody has that opportunity. It says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants all to repent. He wants all to believe on him. Uh, so that's contrary to Calvinist teaching. God wants every man. He likes every man that comes into the world. He gives every man an opportunity, but they reject it. That's what it comes down to. You have a responsibility to respond correctly to light, and then you get more faith when you respond with, with faith. John chapter 12, verse 46. John 12, 46. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. So you, the Bible says, what shall we sin that, that grace shall abound? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So God called us out of darkness into the light. Uh, you, you know what? Because when you responded to that light and you said, I want Jesus Christ, you knew that you were low down and dirty and sorry and wicked. And you didn't, you repented. You didn't, you didn't want to continue in your wrongdoings. You didn't want to continue to live wicked. You wanted God to save you, to make you born again, to change your life, to, to create a new creature in you. You wanted that. You might not have knew exactly all those doctrines. You didn't probably understand all that, but that's what you wanted. When you received him, you wanted to do right. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth in me should not abide in darkness. So amen. That's the, the spiritual man. The spiritual man, he does not want to continue to do the things that he used to do when he was the natural man. When he was the lost man, he did a lot of things. And you know what? That sin nature is still there, but you have a new desire. You have a new desire to, to get more light, to, to reject that darkness still. You don't, you don't feel comfortable living that way anymore. Acts 26, verse 22 through 23. This, one, this message is a little long. Not, not, I didn't expect it to be this long. If you got to watch it in little segments, I hope you go through it all and hear it, but I, I understand if you can only, your attention span only allows you to watch somebody just sitting there in one spot without any cut scenes or anything like that. I understand you, if you can only watch it for five minutes at a time. Acts 26, verses 22 through 23. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both the small and great, saying none other things than those which are, uh, the prophets and Moses did say uh, should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. So that is faith in the gospel and how the light is received. You're you, you receive light, and it's Jesus Christ, revel, the revelation of Jesus Christ uh, that he rose from the dead. It's, he died in your place. He rose again. That's the light that, that brings salvation. Isaiah 6, 
50 uh, verses 19 through 20. A lot of Bible. A lot of Bible. But you can't go wrong with, with Bible. If you just get up there and tell a bunch of stories, you know. We're not supposed to speak with man's wisdom. We're supposed to we're supposed to speak in the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 19 through 20. The sun shall be no, no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee. We're talking about Jesus being the light. But the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God, uh, and thy God and thy glory. So in eternity, he is the only light. We don't even need a sun anymore. We don't need a moon anymore. That uh, um, I'm getting ahead of it. Thy sun shall no more go down, neither shall thy moon withdraw itself. For the Lord shall be thine everlasting light, and the days of thy morning shall be, uh, shall be ended. So people that want light, people that want truth, now they receive light, and then they get, they get light for eternity. That's what the new Jerusalem is going to be. It's going to be nothing but light. Jesus Christ is going to be the light. You know, a lot of people, they don't, they don't want to go to heaven because righteousness dwells there. They love darkness, and God's going to allow them to go there forever. That's what they wanted. They're, they're going to they're gonna be separated from God for eternity in, in everlasting darkness, and that's, that's what we're going to get to right here, this last part. We've got just two more verses, uh, or two more spots to turn. Revelation 21 verses 23 to, through 25. 21, 23 through 25. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. You don't want to go to heaven. If, if you love wickedness and you love your sin and you love your fornication and you love your adultery and your idolatry and all this and you love yourself more than you love God, you, you don't want to go to heaven because you won't, you won't get to have all your carnal pleasures there. You know, it's, that's not what's there. It's the light. It's Jesus Christ. You need, to, you need to come to the light. That's what you need. Matthew verse 8 through 12, and this is the last spot we're going to turn. Actually, right after that, I want to go right back to where we started in Genesis 3. Matthew 8, verse 12. Matthew 8, and verse 12. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know what? People that live for this kingdom, people that live for this world, and those that would receive uh, a bribe from Satan, you know, sell your soul and all that kind of stuff. You want darkness, you just, you just want the kingdoms of this world. Well, those children, the children of darkness, the children of disobedience, the people uh, that reject truth, the people that reject light, the people that reject Jesus Christ, the people that say the word of God is nothing but a lie and it's a fable, you know where you're going to go? A place of outer darkness. There shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. While well, I'm going to party with my friends. No, you're not. You're going to sit there and gnash your teeth. And you're going to cry out for water. And you won't get no water. You know why? Because he's the living water. And you just say, oh, I just wish I had some light. Uh, you know what? But you don't get light because he's the light. You know, and, and you're going to be stuck there with your memories. You're going to be stuck there. Maybe even hearing me preach the word of God. and Or the street corner preacher. And, and you're going to remember how you pushed it away, how you tried to, 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 uh, to thwart God's preacher's plan of, of bringing other people to Jesus Christ. You were uh, not just wicked, but you were ungodly. You know what the ungodly is? Ungodly is beyond just being a sinner. It's people that try to wreck the gospel work. People that, that got to just do tweets. You know, they got to tweet their unbelief. They got to tweet their love for, for darkness. They got to tweet how Christians are stupid and, and backwoods and all that, and they tried to wreck other people's faith. They're going to get the, a, a greater condemnation. God's going to exact it out perfectly. You're going to get damned just exactly what you, what, what you deserve. And you know what? I deserve it. You deserve it. 
We all deserve it. But you don't have to receive damnation. You don't have to receive condemnation. Because why? Genesis chapter 3. Let's go back real quick. And this is where we're going to close. And look at verse 20 and 21. And Adam called his wife name Eve, his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all the living. And you know what? It says the faith of Adam in my heading there from uh, Schofield. And I looked at Dake and he also said the faith of Adam. And I didn't really understand that, but maybe because even though they just fell into sin, and even though the whole human race just fell, and there's going to be grave co consequences to all that, he had a faith enough to know, you know what, my wife, life is going to go on, we're going to have to... We're, we're going to have to live by faith. Um, you know, God used to walk with us in the cool of the day, and he can't do that no more. And I'm going to name my wife Eve, and she's going to be the mother of all the living. You know what? But that's not enough. Verse 21. Unto Adam also, and to his wife. You know what? Because the man exercised faith in a very bleak and dark situation. God says, I'm going to come down there, and I'm going to make coats for them. I'm going to cover them up. They think they're covered right now, but they're not covered because when I show up, they hide themselves in the bushes. They know that their religion ain't saving them. They know they're not covering themselves with those little fig leaves that they're still naked in my sight. Unto Adam and also to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. So he's like, I'm going to come down there. I don't like using the word like. God's going to come down and he's going to clothe them in his righteousness. He's going to cover their sins for them. So, that is that second birth. There's two births. You're born once. You're born after Adam and you're born after Eve. That's a physical, carnal, natural man. Verse 21, that's talking about that second birth. But that second birth is by faith. You, you, if you have faith, God will... If you have faith in Jesus Christ being a substitution for you, He is the Lamb of God. He will cover what your religion cannot cover. Your religion cannot make you righteous before God. Your religion, your religion will make you fall short of the glory of God. But if you want to stand righteous in God's sight in the last day and know that your sins are forgiven and that when God looks at you, all he sees is Jesus Christ. He sees his righteous son. He does not see you. That's by faith. And, and John chapter 3 teaches that. So there's natural man and there's spiritual man know ye not that you must be born again nicodemus don't you know that you must be born again that your first birth will never get you in the kingdom of god you need to be born again spiritually you need to trust have faith in jesus christ and his salvation that he provided and and i just pray that everybody that watches this video if you're not saved that you'd be saved today quit putting it off today is an accepted time to, uh, uh, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Thank you for joining me, and I, and I hope you were blessed.